Hi there, I'm Brian Esparza Walker, and this is another episode of my video and podcast explainer series on the political science behind modern American and Canadian constitutionalism. Today's session is on John Rawls as a representative of the old style liberalism in North America. Where I grew up is close to Maine and has always been a bit Boston-centric, so perhaps there was some sort of geographic destiny in me falling so hard in love with American political philosophy. Growing up in Canada, where the idea of democracy has always been a bit of a hard sell, representation by population was a slogan, but not really an actuality, or not really a reality. Uh, it was immensely mind-opening to uh, go to the United States and first study and then for 10 years teach American political theory uh, at the University of California. This is a picture of the walk I took every morning when I went out to get bread. And this was the vision of my neighborhood that I got uh, at the end of the eight mile bike ride from UCLA where I worked to Venice where I lived. And in LA I learned the secret of happiness on earth, which is marry a Mexican. Get the best of that little uh, uh, northern uh, Mexican Indian uh, magic and resistance and a bit of that Spanish Spanish what's not to like by the end of my time in California though the culture was beginning to live up to the reputation for vapidness and shallowness it had not been like that when I moved there it was a scintillating city full of fascinating well-read people but by the time I was out of the university uh, in 2019, uh, everyone seemed to be talking in the same shallow ways and representing a great shift from the uh, progressive leftism of the pre-1990s period that my teachers had taught me. There was like a 180 degree shift away from all that uh, towards a uh, new race ideology Here's a cover of The Economist magazine. God bless them for their well-balanced journalism. Even this article is not as negative as the title makes it sound. They have really well-balanced articles on wokeness and the woke movement. It's a, a, a cross-continental movement towards uh, a form of uh, political thinking focused on raising up minorities and uh, giving them uh, more resources and making reparations for the past. Uh, it's uh, everyone began to be influenced by the same uh, raise up the minorities, make reparations model. But those models, by only looking at 25 or 30 percent of the population, aren't really looking at everybody. John Rawls is a representative of the previous generation of liberal democratic thinkers in the United States. He was writing at the end of the 60s, well, all throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s. He was very, very influential. He was a descendant of the uh, civil rights movement that fought Jim Crow in the, United uh, in the United States and the American South. The Jim Crow cars on trains, the Jim Crow was just like a, a, a rough alcoholic guy, just a slang word for a rough alcoholic guy. And the Jim Crow cars on trains were like the old parlor car on the on the Via Rail to uh, Ottawa or uh, to Montreal back in the bad old days where everyone drank on board. It was full of ruffians and polite white people uh, liked to be able to buy tickets for their fancy parlor car where they were, they were able to escape the riffraff and black people complained that if white people were able to get under the Jim Crow car, so should they. Now, it shouldn't be just one group that is a fancy parlor car. Either give black people a parlor car of the same level uh, or uh, make everybody be in the same parlor cars so that the general quality of the parlor cars goes up. This is a form of social contract thinking, the idea that everybody is in society on the same level. And maybe, uh, in the words of Thurgood Marshall, everybody should be getting the same things at the same time in the same places so that they have a sense of civic fraternity and a sense of, of civic commonality, and they're all together. And so you fight segregation uh, in the name of raising up uh, the, 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 the common good. Uh, Social contract thinking is all about the common good for everybody, uh, what would be good for absolutely everybody in society. And it goes back to the idea of the French Revolution, of the indivisibilité of the Republic. 
in the 1980s and 1990s, people begin to uh, reject this model completely in the name of a completely different model of society where law is no longer based on a kind of a democratic attempt to figure out what everyone needs and to satisfy that as in the social contract tradition that comes out of Rousseau and the idea of civic fraternity and so on. Uh, the, that's the tradition that John Rawls is in. Basically, the lineage is Rousseau is taken over by Immanuel Kant and by uh, Gottfried Hegel in the 19th century and uh, modernizes social contract thinking. And John Rawls is trying to work out the problems that those thinkers left over. So Rousseau to Kant to Rawls. That's the social contract tradition, and it's based on trying to convince everybody of the validity of the laws. The post-1990s model is based on the idea that you can move a lot faster if you stop trying to convince other people, just put judges in office that have the right values, and you can kind of make progress very, very swiftly just by forcing it through the kind of the coercive model of law that uh, came into Europe through the works of Nietzsche and Max Weber and was eventually very, very influential through the works of Carl Schmitt and people arguing with Carl Schmitt like Walter Benjamin and Hannah Arendt and Jürgen Habermas. So the social contract model, by contrast to the law as force model that became popular after the 90s, is based on the idea that you're trying to find values that are good for everybody. Uh, you shouldn't have a regime, uh, you shouldn't be like the fox who has the stork over for supper and then serves it in a, uh, a dish that the stork can't eat out. Laws should be for everybody. There should be no victims in society. And this is a, a core idea in Rawls. Uh, I argue that bilingualism in New Brunswick is, a, uh, is an aristocratic style system, what I call a Tati Danielle system. Uh, those kinds of systems are great from the point of view of those benefiting from the system, but from the people who have to mop the floor in the system, uh, who just serve the system without getting anything from it, they're not so good. The, it's as if they're made into the victims of, of the system. Social contract thinking, by contrast, there's no victim. You're trying to get a vision of social philosophy that doesn't victimize anybody in the way the old aristocratic philosophies of Europe victimized the peasant class, as in the picture on the far left here. I see this as having resurged again after the war in the works of Albert Camus. Another of the big themes in Rawls, besides just the anti-segregation and the idea of everybody being in the same community, is the idea of freedom. Before the 1990s, there was a very serious trend of left libertarianism. Uh, here's a couple of great old books on, on liberty. One, Bruce Johansson's text about how it was the Iroquois and the Huron who taught Americans like Ben Franklin and Walt uh, and Henry David Thoreau what freedom really was, or Mer uh, Felt Tyler's book on freedom's ferment. Before the 1990s, freedom was a really big issue for many people. Uh, I highly recommend this book by Mark Bevere, who argues that Thoreau and Whitman and Emerson were major influences on the social democratic forces in Britain, such as Bevan and the authors of the, Net, the, the foundation of the National Health Service. This used to be the old uh, civics textbook for New Brunswick back in the 1960s, Charters of Our Freedom, all about the idea of freedom. So. Freedom was a really big word in the 1960s, and it's, it plays a central role in Rawls' work. There's, of course, a wide array of different ways of thinking about freedom, from uh, Milton Friedman and right-wing libertarianism. Uh, John Stuart Mill wrote probably the best book ever on freedom, on liberty. One of the forms of liberty that's most important uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, progressive left, is the idea of diversity in thinking, that uh, any idea has to be seen from a lot of different sides. So if you get kind of a one-dimensional consciousness, one-dimensional man, the kind of the McDonaldization of the mind, uh, then it's a real problem. The modern uh, left is, uh, has a very different model. It's the idea that the, uh, the informed population is not one that sees all sides of the argument, an informed population is one that has been educated in the correct side 
uh, of the argument. Uh, uh, the, 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 the new post-progressive leftism is about thought standardization and about to get, uh, Jacques Poitras of the CBC just re continually writes the same article. All uh, people who resist bilingualism are Engli ignorant English people and they need to be corrected and they need to go to some kind of bilingualism camp. So the old pre-1990s leftism was anti-puritanical. It was about toleration. It was about seeing both sides of an issue and it hated ethnic politics. Post-1990s leftism, the shift is entirely uh, in a different direction. Uh, the standardization is fine as long as it serves the needs of minorities like Acadians or black power activists or Latino activists. So it's a very confusing outcome because a formerly progressive movement is now profoundly anti-democratic and in some ways anti-ethical. Uh, a, a journalist like Jacques Poitras acting as a naked uh, partisan, there's a conflict between the idea of being a journalist and being a partisan. And this brings me to another topic in Rawls, which is the idea of being coherent with your values. One of the big problems with politics in my own home province of New Brunswick is that people talk about social contract all the time without any intention of living up to it as an ethical ideal. And they talk about cultural equality all the time, but purely as a way of clobbering other people. It's never a, as an ethical idea. It's all from the point of view of legalism and naked self-interest. And so in many ways, the post-1990s period in North America is when the left becomes post-ethical. It's no longer it, it uses an ethical language of democracy and rights and cultural equality and social contract, but those are all weaponized only. They're never actually used as ethical ideals. And in this podcast, I see myself, I'm an Acadian person. I inherited uh, an Acadian culture through my dad, who was the son of an Acadian mother, uh, but I see myself as speaking up in the name of a progressive Acadianism, one that would leave behind the ethnic populism and unethical uh, unfairness of the old models of Acadianism for something new, more fair, and more just.